Hi friends, welcome back to Curious with. I am Dr. Mohsina. In today's video, we will see canine distemper, an important viral disease in dogs. Today we will discuss about the etiology, pathogenesis, clinical signs, diagnosis, prevention and control methods of canine distemper. So let's begin. Canine distemper is a highly contagious systemic viral disease of dogs seen worldwide. Clinically, canine distemper is characterized by a diaphasic fever, leukopenia, GI and respiratory catarrh, and frequently pneumonic and neurologic complications as well. The epidemiology of canine distemper is little bit complicated by the large number of species susceptible to infection. The disease is seen in a wide range of species like Canidae, Large Felidae, Primates, Viveridae, Muscleidae, etc. The animals belonging to each species are given here. Domestic dogs, including feral populations, are considered to be the reservoir species in most locations. And antigenic drift and strain diversity is increasingly documented in association with outbreaks in wild species, domestic dogs and exotic animals held in zoos and parks. Now let's see the etiology and pathogenesis. Canine distemper virus is a paramyxovirus closely related to measles and rinderpest virus. It is fragile, enveloped and single-stranded RNA virus. This virus is sensitive to lipid solvents such as ether and most disinfectants including phenols and quaternary ammonium compounds. It is relatively unstable outside the host. The main route of infection is via aerosol droplet secretions from infected animals. Some infected dogs may shed virus for several months. The virus initially replicates in the lymphatic tissue of respiratory tract and a cell-associated viremia results in infection of all lymphatic tissues which is followed by infection of respiratory GI and urogenital epithelium as well as the CNS and optic nerves. Disease follows viral replication in these tissues. The degree of viremia and extent of viral spread to various tissues is moderated by the level of specific humoral immunity in the host during the viremic period. Now we will see a flow chart about the pathogenesis of canine distemper here. The virus replicate in local uh, lymphoid tissues of respiratory tract like tonsils and then uh, move on to systemic lymphoid tissues. At this at this stage, humoral and cellular immune response may cause recovery from disease or otherwise the virus moves to respiratory, elementary or urogenital tract causing clinical signs like subacute encephalitis and can cause death. Here you can see a pictorial representation that kind of distemper virus replicates here in uh, tonsils uh, like uh, other and other lymphoid tissues. Then uh, moves to the lymphatic duct that is systemic uh, lymphatic circulation. Later to perivascular infection, then later leading to periventricular infection and at this stage it can move to the nerves and brain. Coming to the clinical findings, a transient fever usually occurs 3 to 6 days after infection and there may be a leukopenia, especially lymphopenia at this time. These signs may go unnoticed or be accompanied by just anorexia. The fever subsides for several days before a second fever occurs and this second fever may be accompanied by serous nasal discharge, mucoperal and ocular discharge, lethargy and anorexia. GI and respiratory signs typically complicated by secondary bacterial infections may follow and rarely pustular dermatitis may be seen. 
can see the pictures of some clinical signs here like serous ocular discharge and blepharitis along with cloudiness of the eye and uh, scan, then you can see scanty nasal discharge hyperkeratinization of uh, pads in dogs suffering from nervous form of canine distemper that we will discuss about it later. Encephalomyelitis may occur in association with these signs and follow uh, the, that follow the systemic disease or occur in the absence of systemic manifestations. Dogs surviving the acute phase may have hyperkeratosis of foot pads and epithelium of the nasal planum as seen in, in the picture here. Also enamel hypoplasia in incompletely erupted teeth. You can see some clinical signs of canine distemper virus infection in this, uh, in this uh, slide here. Discharge from eyes, discharge from nose, thick and po pads and nose, cough, lethargy and fever. Overall, a longer course of illness is associated usually with the presence of neurologic signs. However, there is no way to anticipate whether an infected dog will develop a neurologic manifestation or not. We can't predict it that the virus will cause neurologic manifestation or not. Now, let's see the classic neurologic signs. It includes localized involuntary muscle twitching or myoclonus, chorea, fluxus spasm or hyperkinesia or otherwise it can cause convulsions including salivation and chewing movements of the jaw. Uh, these chewing movements of the jaw are also known as chewing gum fits. Other neurologic signs include circling, head tilt, nystagmus, paresis to paralysis, focal to generalized seizures as well. Emerging viral strains may be associated with greater neurotropism and these viral strains cause increased morbidity and mortality from the neurologic complications. A dog may exhibit any or, or all of these multisystemic signs during the course of the disease. Infection may be mild and inapparent or lead to severe disease with most of the described signs here. The course of the systemic disease may be as short as 10 days. But the onset of neurologic signs may be delayed for several weeks or months as a result of chronic progressive demyelination within the CNS. So the chronic progressive demyelination in the CNS is the cause of neurologic signs. Clinical pathologic findings are non-specific and include lymphopenia, with the possible finding of viral inclusion body in circulating leukocytes very early in the course of the disease. Thoracic radiograph may reveal an interstitial pattern typical of viral pneumonia. Here you can see the blood film from CDV infected dog and uh, inclusion bodies are visible in within a neutrophil and a lymphocyte here. Chronic distemper encephalitis also known as old dog encephalitis is a condition often marked by ataxia Compulsive movements such as head pressing or continual pacing and incoordinated hypermetria. 
This old dog encephalitis may be seen in a fully vaccinated adult dog without a history suggestive of systemic canine distemper infection. Although canine distemper antigen has been detected in the dogs with ODE by fluorescent antibody staining or genetic methods, dogs with ODE are not infectious and replication component of the virus has not been isolated. The disease is caused by inflammatory reaction associated with persistent CD virus infection in the CNS, but the mechanism that triggers this syndrome is unknown. Now let's see the lesions. Thymic atrophy is the co co consistent postmortem finding in infected young puppies. Hyperkeratosis of nose and foot pads is often found with neurologic manifestations. Depending on the degree of secondary bacterial infection, bronchopneumonia, enteritis, and skin pustules are seen. And in case of acute to paracute death, exclusively respiratory abnormalities may be found. So here you can see. Uh, a broad range of different clinical signs and lesions caused by uh, CDV. It is ocular signs, neurologic signs, pneumonia, enteritis, abortion and infertility, lymphoid necrosis and opportunistic infestation, infection, nasal and foot pad hyperkeratosis and enamel hyperplasia. Histologically, canine distemper virus produces necrosis of lymphatic tissues, interstitial pneumonia and cytoplasmic and intranuclear inclusion bodies in the respiratory, urinary and GI epithelium. So this is a blood smear stained with right stain. You can see canine distemper virus cytoplasmic inclusion bodies. Inclusion bodies are mainly seen in uh, leukocytes like neutrophils and uh, ne neutrophils and monocytes here. Lesions found in the brains of dogs with neurologic complications include neuronal degeneration, gliosis, non-inflammatory demyelination, perivascular cuffing, non-separative leptomeningitis and intranuclear inclusion bodies predominantly within the glial cells. Moving on to diagnosis, canine distemper should be considered in the diagnosis of any febrile condition in dogs with multisystemic manifestations. Characteristic signs sometimes do not appear until late in the disease and the clinical picture may be modified by concurrent parasitism and numerous viral or bacterial infections. Distemper in dogs may be confused with other systemic infections, so differential diagnosis with leptospirosis, infectious canine hepatitis, rocky mountain spotted fever has to be done and intoxicants such as lead or OP can cause simultaneous GI and neurologic signs. A febrile catarrhal illness with neurologic sequel justifies a clinical diagnosis of canine distemper. In dogs with multisystemic signs, the following can be examined by immunofluorescent assay or RT-PCR. So, smears of conjunctival, tracheal, vaginal or other epithelium, buffy coat of the blood, urine sediment or bone marrow aspirates can be examined by immunofluorescent assay or RT-PCR. Commercially available quantitative RT-PCR can usually distinguish natural infection from vaccinal virus. A combined two-step RT-PCR to distinguish vaccinal strains from emerging wild-type strains has also been described and this assay would be of particular value in the epidemiologic investigations or in outbreaks in non-canine species. Antibody titers or ELISA can be performed on CSF and compared with peripheral blood and a relatively higher level in the CSF is typical of natural infection versus vaccination. Viral antigen immunofluorescent assay or fluorescent in situ hybridization for viral DNA can be performed on biopsies from the foot pads or from hair skin of dorsal neck. At necropsy, diagnosis is usually confirmed by histologic lesions, IFA or both. 
These samples are often negative when the dog is showing only neurologic manifestations or when circulating antibodies present or both, requiring that the diagnosis is made by CSF evaluation or RT-PCR as described before. Now let's see the treatment. Treatments are symptomatic and supportive and the treatment is aimed at limiting the secondary bacterial invasion. Also it should support fluid balance and control the neurologic manifestations. And the treatment includes broad spectrum antibiotics, balanced electrolyte solutions, parenteral nutrition, antipyretics, analgesics and anticonvulsants and good nursing care. No single treatment is specific or uniformly successful. Experimental in vitro work with antiviral agents shows promise but these agents have not yet been widely used. Unfortunately, treatment for acute neurologic manifestations of distemper is frequently unsuccessful. If the neurologic signs are progressive or severe, the owner should be appropriately advised. With prompt aggressive care, dogs may recover completely from multisystemic manifestations, but in other cases, neurologic signs may persist after the GI and respiratory signs have resolved. Some dogs with chronic progressive or vaccine-induced forms of neurologic disease may respond to immunosuppressive therapy with, with anti-inflammatory or greater doses of glucocorticoids. Now let's see the prevention methods. With the potential increasing virulence of emerging strains and the wide a host range of canine distemper virus, widespread vaccination of domestic dogs is essential. Successful immunization of pups with canine distemper modified live virus vaccine depends on the lack of interference by maternal antibody. To overcome this barrier, pups are vaccinated with MLV vaccine when 6 month old and at 3 to 4 week interval until 16 week old. Alternatively, measles virus vaccine induces immunity to CDV in presence of relatively larger level of maternal distemper antibody and MLV measles vaccine is administered at 6 to 7 month old followed by uh, two more doses when, uh, when the pup is 12 to 16 week old. Many varieties of attenuated distemper vaccine are available and should be used according to manufacturer's directions. MLV vaccines should not be used in late pregnant or early lactation bitches. MLV vaccines can produce post-vaccinal illness in some, some immunosuppressed dogs. A recombinant canary pox vector vaccine expressing distemper virus protein is licensed for use in ferrets. The American Association of Zoo Veterinarians recommends its, its extra label use in many at-risk species, at species held in zoos and parks. Historically, annual revaccination has been standard because of the outbreaks in protection that can occur in stressed disease or immunosuppressed dogs or because vaccines have been labeled for uh, and, and because vaccines have been labeled for annual use. Substantial evidence support the finding that immunity induced by MLV distemper vaccine lasts more than three years. However, in most cases, this remains an extra label use of vaccine. Thus, decisions to revaccinate less often than annually should be considered in light of the local prevalence of the disease and other potential risk factors as well as industry and professional organization recommendations. So that's all about canine distemper in dogs. This is a very important topic. So please go through all the different aspects like etiology, pathogenesis, clinical signs, diagnosis, treatment and prevention methods. If the video is informative, please like it and share it with your friends. If you are new to this channel, please subscribe and click the notification bell so that you get notified 
every time I upload a video. See you soon with another video. Thank you.